Welcome to the podcast, Claim Your Excellent Life, with your host, Suzanne Kellner Zink, where she helps professional women learn how to be happy. Suzanne will teach you how to do this through building high self esteem, relaxation and calm, and good, healthy relationships. Tune in every week as Suzanne shares effective strategies to help you claim your excellent life with happiness techniques, self esteem building exercises, relationship tips, and relaxation information. Make sure to head over to dawningvisions.com to subscribe to the newsletter to receive your keys to happiness, as well as other useful free gifts for you. In this episode of Claim Your Excellent Life, we are doing Marianne Williamson's Tears to Triumph, Part 2, The Metaphysics of Spiritual Teachings. And boy, are these important teachings for you to pay attention to. So let us get started right now. Buddha is the first teacher from whom we learn about spirituality. He said that he taught about suffering, its origin, and its cessation. That's all I teach, he said. And that the only antidote to that suffering is is infinite compassion or enlightenment. The only way out of our suffering is to identify with the suffering of others. The only meaning to our suffering is that it might expand our hearts so we can. Some of you may have read the books of Arthur while you were in high school, as I did. He was a prince of a king who wanted to keep his son inside the confines of the castle of the kingdom. He wanted Arthur to grow up and follow his royal footsteps. So he kept him shielded from religious teachings throughout his life and only allowed pleasurable things to exist inside this castle home for his son. His father exposed him to everything that he thought would make Siddhartha happy and keep him tied to the royal household. By the age of 29, with no exposure to life outside this opulent environment, he felt very restless inside. He knew that there was more to human existence than the material grandeur that he was raised with, but it was something he hadn't seen, yet he needed to see it. So he set out on a series of rides throughout the countryside, seeking to discover the world that lay beyond the walls of his father's house. He saw an aged man, a sick man, and a corpse. It was really the first time Sir Arthur had saw the realities of aging, disease, and death. He was profoundly changed as a result. He realized that all the objects of luxury that we use to keep our suffering at bay in a time deteriorate and turn back into dust. And it's a mere illusion to think otherwise. Siddhartha had seen a wandering aesthetic, someone who had renounced the world and sought release from fear of death and suffering. And he chose this as his path. He left the palace, shaved his head, and put on beggar's robe. And thus, his search for enlightenment began. It was not an easy path. The investment of his illusions took him through various forms of suffering as he was forced to face down the demons of the delusional self. The false gods of the ego mind, embodied in Buddhism as the demon, Mara, which means destruction, sought to fool, betray, and ensnare him, as they do all of us. Yet Siddhartha cleaved to his recognition of the eternal that lies beyond the temporary, the clarity beyond passion, and the truth beyond illusion. The great mental battle between the forces of truth and falsehood that raged within him is revered as his approach to enlightenment beneath the Bodhi tree. Though Mara mentally tortured him, the earth itself promised to bear him witness, and Mara was, was ultimately defeated. Siddhartha's eyes were opened to the true nature of reality, and he became the Buddha or awakened one. He saw attachment to the world as the source of our suffering, and infinite compassion as the key to transcending it. The teachings that emerge from this realization are a path by which billions of souls have pierced the veil of illusion that blinds us to ultimate reality, for in remembering his journey, we're awakened to our own. It's really through the Buddha's enlightenment that we can transcend our own, suffering as he transcended his. And as Marianne says, the world is a measurably more beautiful place for all the light he brought into the world. His four noble truths 
One, things of this world can provide only temporary happiness at best. Two, suffering is caused by our attachment to the things of this world. Three, we can be liberated from our attachments to the things in this world and thus freed from our suffering. And four, through the Eightfold Path or the Middle Way, choosing neither luxury nor extreme self-denial, we can be free of suffering. The Eightfold Path includes right understanding, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. These are the keys to a peaceful mind. Right understanding. Buddhism proclaims that the only ultimate reality is real. And it is our attachment to that which is unreal that causes us to suffer. Life simply is what it is. It's not the events that cause us to suffer so much as how we perceive those events. Only love is real, and then unkindness does not exist except in the realm of illusion. Through right understanding, we can extend our perceptions beyond what the physical senses perceive to the true reality that lies beyond. Understand that through our visual perception, when we see the railroad going far away, it looks like the tracks are actually getting closer together when in fact they're parallel to one another. So we know that our senses do lie to us. The words disciple and discipline come from the same root. It takes discipline to focus on what is fundamentally true, despite appearances. Right understanding means refusing to defer to reality that does not actually exist, despite the fact that our physical senses insist that it does. Right intention. The power of intention has become widely recognized as power that can be used for the purposes of both spirit and ego. When used for the spirit, intention is a tool of co-creating a more loving world. Used by the ego, it's a tool for simply trying to get whatever it is we think we want. Using the power of our mind for something that we want out of self-will is not necessarily spiritual. That which does not serve love does not serve the spiritual unfolding of the universe. For the spiritual unfolding of the universe is love and love only. This is according to Miriam's writing. So right intention is a higher vibration entirely. It is the intention that only love prevail for all living things. Buddha spoke of both right intention and wrong intention. Right intention means the intention to be an instrument of healing. Wrong intention means to be an instrument of harm. Neutrality is not an option because all thought creates an effect on some level. What we don't intend for loving purposes will be appropriated for fearful ones. Right intention causes in us to be at a higher level of consciousness that most of us have yet to reach. Marianne says she hasn't, and neither have I. We can try to improve at whatever rate we can. Although simply living in our modern society poses constant challenges to the concept of right intention. Understand that the harm that we do to others and the harm that we allow to be done to others are added to the karmic burden we collectively carry forward. Red intention is important to understanding how to heal our suffering because it encourages us to rethink the causes of our pain as well as the appropriate response to it. We can intend to be instrument of good even when we least feel like doing so. Right speech is an important aspect of right-mindedness. The words we say have a subtle and not-so-subtle influence on us and those around us. The right use of words is an important tool to the path to transforming our suffering. Buddha identified four keys to right speech. Words spoken with affection, with honesty, for the good of others, and with the intent of doing good. It also applies to how we speak about ourselves, because if we think about all the negative thoughts that we carry, the things that we say to ourselves, we, sometimes we treat ourselves worse than our worst enemies would. So let go of those self-degenerating things that you say to yourself, like, I'm so stupid, I'm such a failure, I'm unworthy of love, I'm never going to be able to be rich and wealthy because I don't deserve it, etc. It is necessary to process life's disappointments, we all go through them, but it's best done in a sacred space of professional counseling, support groups, and trusted friendships. And by trusted friendships, 
Marion and I are both speaking of people who will not judge you when you tell them your truth. Rather, they will validate your feelings and help you to come to a better understanding of what's going on. That's what true friendship is all about. Also, when you learn about neurolinguistic programming and hypnosis, we learn a lot about vocal variety in that our vocal tone represents 33% of the communication, which is why a lot of times when people text one another, they get pissed off at one another because they can't hear the intonation that's being used. The same thing can happen in emails as well. I usually only send emails in letter form to people who truly understand how I speak and what I would be saying because they know me that well. Otherwise, the phone or in person is the way to go. Because you've got to understand, we have vocal variety for a reason. It's a very important part of our communication. We can hurt people very easily with our tonality. Being angry and taking out our stress on the people we say we love, it's not a good thing to do, folks. Or having an attitude with somebody. Or how about hanging out with whiny teenagers? Man, there's a ton out of that drives me up the wall. So, right speech is more than what we say, it's how we say it. Be careful with how you communicate. Because, just because we choose to share our truth as we observe another person's behaviors or actions, doesn't mean that we need to do it in an abusive or non-supportive manner. Choose your words wisely, check in on your tonality, and do it in a loving, concerned manner. And then, guess what? That person might actually hear what you have to say and make the changes that you see would make their lives better and healthier. Learning to be as honest and authentic as possible, yet taking responsibility for the heart space between ourselves and someone else is essential to enlightenment. Gandhi talked about the power of not speaking at all. He said, speak only if it improves upon the silence. And really, meditation is all about enabling us to be still and quiet of mind. So we can learn something called impulse control. So we can get clear on what it is that's important in life and be grounded in how we walk through this life so maybe we won't hurt other people unintentionally or intentionally. If we do get hurt, surrender our feelings to God, the universe, whatever you call that higher being out there, and then reflect on the highest good. We're guided not only by what we say, but also when and how to say it. It makes all the difference in the world. So really do get yourself centered before you speak to people about things that you believe they need to think about before continuing going forward. Also, negative gossip applies to a right speech. If a person we're talking about wouldn't be glad to hear what we're saying, please, refrain yourself. There's no need to say it. If you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything at all. Because what we say all carries vibration. We don't need to give ourselves emotional permission to do whatever it is that we want. We need to take the right action, doing the right thing, as this is the only path of enlightenment. Because, guess what? It flows from the guidance of our essence, which comes from our heart. Right livelihood. is really the principle of making an ethical career choice. Meaning... We're not harming anybody or anything in the process of making our income. However, sometimes we invest in companies that are doing harm to our world at large. So do think about who you are investing in company-wise for those retirement funds. Sometimes we wonder whether we should speak up or not. And I can tell you that two of my three jobs in mental health, I left because I couldn't stand the fact that my clients with mental illness were being blamed for being mentally ill and treated like garbage by my bosses who had no compassion in those two jobs. They're much more worried about their egos and keeping control of their little fight for there. So I left those jobs and moved into hypnosis. After putting in my complaints 
about the way the clients were being treated by my bosses in each of these positions. It wasn't a fun thing to go through, but to tell you the truth, I'd do it again in a heartbeat. Because those people who really truly need us to be present for them, we need to be present for them, whether or not it's something that we want to do, or that's easy or hard to do. We just have to do it. And I can tell you this, it's a lot easier doing the hypnosis, working for myself, not dealing with those little fiefdoms, and helping people to really get in touch with how they can truly create change and transformation in their lives using their thoughts. Because as I said before, thoughts create our reality, they create our health and our well-being, or our ill health or not so well-being. Spirituality does not afford us to care only for ourselves in relation to the money or anything else. Right livelihood is part of the Eightfold Path and puts the issue in front of us in a significant way. Great effort. The proactive cultivation of enlightenment as the only antidote to the neurotic obsessions of the ego mind. A mind that is not conscious and proactively attuned to the effort of right-mindedness is part of the service of wrong-mindedness. Mara is always seeking to triumph over love and uses any opportunity to take advantage of our lack of vigilance. Right effort is more important than ever because one of the things that is particularly debilitating about sadness, that which is attached to depression, is that it drains us of our energy. Mara feeds on laziness, procrastination, and rationalization and self-indulgence. Sometimes the right effort is to apologize to someone. Sometimes it's to start a payment plan to pay off a bill. Sometimes it's to clear the air of a relationship. Sometimes it's just to exercise or meditate more or eat better or read more. Sometimes it's to be of service. And sometimes it's just to write a thank you note. And sometimes it's to participate in your responsibilities as a citizen. Donate to a good cause or to clean up your house. Sometimes it's to call a friend or family member. In our hearts, we usually know what to do. Right effort simply means that we choose to do it. Whatever right effort we can make on behalf of compassion for ourselves and others, the universe will receive it and will respond in kind. We make the effort to follow principles of enlightenment. The powers of enlightenment empower us. Right mindfulness. Now you hear mindfulness everywhere you go today. Mindful eating. Mindful parenting. Mindful work. Being mindful is certainly the apex of the spiritual journey, as it's a mental alignment from whence all compassion comes. Right mindfulness means right awareness or right attention. It means disciplining the mind to remember what is eternal beyond the temporary, embracing ultimate reality beyond the illusions of the world. Right mindfulness is an attainment of state of consciousness beyond all concepts, symbols, and illusions, false associations of the mortal mind. It's really the intersection of the human and the divine. The mindful mind is the whole or holy mind. Right concentration is the correct focus of the mind. Focusing the mind on what is true. Not only to rise above suffering, but transforming it. It involves the cultivation of a quiet mind to still the forces of chaos within us. Meditation practice trains us to stay focused on the present. When the mind is always so obsessed with either going back into the past, which can't be changed, or the future, which really hasn't happened yet. Buddhists use meditation to focus the mind on what is really true as a way of dissolving that which is not. Right concentration reminds us that simply trying to think positive thoughts is not enough to override our mental anguish. It takes the discipline of serious meditation to hone our attitudinal muscles. It doesn't really matter what our meditation practice is. It just is a very powerful tool for concentrating the mind on all that is real. Now, honestly, I don't do meditation. I do self-hypnosis because I find meditation boring. But for those who can do it, congratulations. The Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path are powerful directives on how to transcend our sorrowful mind while becoming enlightened beings. Because this teaching was so lengthy, I'm going to do a part three of Marion's teaching 
which will include the teachings from Moses and of Jesus. Because these are very powerful metaphysical teachings that can only help to improve our lives to the degree that we're willing to learn them and apply them. And honestly, there's very few places that I have gotten this kind of deep understanding of these spiritual teachings. It's really a true gift that she's given us, and this is why I'm spending all of these podcasts illuminating your world with her teachings from these amazing teachers from our past. I also want to remind you of the trainings that I'm in the process of putting together for reversing diabetes, type 2 diabetes only, for children and their parents so that everyone's on the same page, for adults with their partners if they have a partner, so again, everyone's on the same page and the environment is conducive to making the dietary and increase in activity changes that will be necessary while learning how to do the hypnotic work that will help everyone to stay on target. CEOs and C-suite executives who are sick of working for soul-sucking companies and soul-sucking jobs, how about getting true to who you are at your deepest essence and doing something that really makes you feel alive and well, using those skills and talents that you've learned all these years? There will only be 12 of you that will be going on these journeys with me. And lastly, health and wellness professionals. We need to be congruent and in our own integrity before we go out there telling the folks that hire us how to live their lives. If you are out of shape, if you are overweight, if you have negative thoughts that are permeating your mind, if you have a lot of anger, sadness, guilt, hurts, any of this stuff going on in your life, and you haven't cleared it, and you know it, you belong in this training. In this training, you are going to learn how to let go of all of those things using the hypnotic arts, and I'm going to teach you how to integrate these teachings you're learning to clear yourself for your own patients and clients. Be a two-week journey to a very spiritual place. We're going to learn how to get in touch with your spirit so that you're true to yourself, transparent and vulnerable with the folks who employ you to help them transform their lives. Fair is fair, guys. If you're not willing to do it for yourself, please don't be out there trying to do it for other people. They don't need you. What the world needs is you healed, so you can become a healed healer because the healed healers are the greatest healers on this planet. Think of Benet Brown, Louise Hay, Byron Katie, John Gray, Wayne Dyer. I could go on forever. You know what I'm talking about. Let us be congruent in our work with our clients and our patients, because it is only when we are congruent and acting in our own integrity that our clients will truly be able to heal, move on to happy, fulfilling lives. For more information on these programs, please call me, Suzanne Connor Zink, at 781-315-1719. I look forward to talking to you about these wonderful programs. As always, thank you for spending your time with me. Till next time. If you have found the information that we have shared with you here on Claim Your Excellent Life to be helpful and interesting, please do us a favor of giving us a rating on iTunes. We hope it will be five stars, as well as a review. Doing both these acts will move the podcast up in the ratings on iTunes so more people will be able to find us. Also, please do us the favor of letting your friends and colleagues know about this podcast so they too can gain the knowledge that we're sharing here. We'd like as many people as possible to learn from what we have to give here. And we thank you for your time and effort in doing so. Thank you for listening to the podcast, Claim Your Excellent Life, with your host, Suzanne Kellner-Zink. 
where she helps professional women learn how to be happy. Suzanne teaches you how to do this through building high self-esteem, relaxation and calm, and good, healthy relationships. Tune in every week as Suzanne shares effective strategies to help you claim your excellent life with happiness techniques, self-esteem building exercises, relationship tips, and relaxation information. Make sure to head over to dawningvisions.com to subscribe to the newsletter to receive your keys to happiness as well as other useful free gifts for you.